Hi, I'm Peter Burris, and welcome to another Wikibon action item. One of the most pressing strategic issues that businesses face is how to get more value out of their data. In our opinion, that's the essence of a digital business transformation, is the using of data as an asset to improve your operations and take better advantage of market opportunities. The problem with data, though, it's shareable, it's copyable, it's reusable, it has, it's easy to create derivative value out of it. One of the biggest misnomers in the digital business world is the notion that data is the new fuel or the new oil. It's not. You can only use oil once. You can apply it to a purpose and not multiple purposes. Data you can apply to a lot of purposes, which is why you are able to get such interesting and increasing returns to that asset if you use it appropriately. Now, this becomes especially important for technology companies that are attempting to provide digital business technologies or services or other capabilities to their customers. In the consumer world, it started to reach ahead. Questions about Facebook's reuse of a person's data through an ad-based business model is now starting to lead people to question uh, the degree to which the information asymmetry about what I'm giving and how they're using it is really worth the value that I get out of Facebook is something that consumers and certainly governments are starting to talk about. It's also one of the bases for GDPR, which is going to start enforcing significant fines in the next month or so. In the B2B world, that question is going to become especially acute. Why? Because as we try to add intelligence to the services and the products that we are utilizing within the digital business, some of that requires a degree of, or some sort of relationship where some amount of data is passed to improve the models and machine learning and AI that are associated with that intelligence. Now, some companies have come out and said, flat out, they're not going to reuse a customer's data. IBM being a good example of that, when Ginny Rometty at IBM Think said, we're not going to reuse our customer's data. The question for the panel here is, is that going to be a part of a differentiating value proposition in the marketplace? Are we going to see circumstances in which companies keep perhaps, perhaps products and services low by reusing a client's data and others sustaining their experience and sustaining a trust model, say they won't. How is that going to play out in front of customers? So joining me today here in the studio, David Floyer. Hi there. And on the uh, remote lines, we have Neil Radin, uh, Jim Kabilis, George Gilbert, and Ralph Fino. Hey guys. Hey, hey, how you doing? All right, so. Good morning, good morning. So, uh, let me, Neil, let me start with you. Uh, you've been in the BI world uh, as a user, as a consultant, uh, for many, many number of years. Uh, help us understand the relationship between data, assets, ownership, and strategy. Oh, God. Um, well, I don't know that I've been in the BI world for like, <laughs> anyway, um, as a consultant, when we would do a project for a company, there were very clear lines of what belonged to us and what belonged to the client. Uh, they were paying us generously. Uh, they would allow us to come into their company um, and, and do things that they needed. And in return, we treated them with respect. We wouldn't take their data. We wouldn't take their data models that we built, for example, uh, and sell them to another company. That's just, as far as I'm concerned, that's just theft. Um, so if I'm housing another company's data because I'm a cloud provider or some sort of application provider, um, and, and I say, well, you know, I can use this data too. To me, the analogy is uh, I'm a warehousing company. And independently, I go into the warehouse and I say, you know, these guys aren't moving their inventory fast enough. I think I'll sell some of it. Uh, it just isn't right. All right, that's a great point. Jim Kabilis, uh, as we think though about the role that data, machine learning play, training models, delivering new classes of services, uh, we don't have uh, a clean answer right now. So what's your thought on how this is likely to play out? I agree totally with Neil, first of all. If it's somebody else's data, you don't own it, therefore you can't sell it, you can't monetize it, clearly. Um, but where you have derivative assets, like uh, machine learning models that are derivative from data, 
you know, it's, it's the same you know, phenomenon, it's the same issue, a higher level. You can build and train or should own uh, your machine learning models only from data that you have legal access to. You own or you have license and so forth. Um, so as you're building these derivative assets, first and foremost, make sure as you're populating your data lake uh, to, to build and you know, do the training that you have clear ownership over the data. So with GDPR and so forth, we have to be doubly, triply vigilant to make sure that we're not using data that we don't have authorized ownership or access to. That is critically important. Um, and so, you know, what I, I get kind of queasy when I hear about some people say, we use blockchain to make uh, the, the sharing of training data more uh, distributed and federated and data, whatever. It's like, wait a second, that doesn't uh, uh, solve the issues of ownership. That makes it even more problematic. If you get this massive blockchain of data coming from hither and yon, who owns what? How do you know? Do you dare build any models whatsoever from any of that data? That's a huge gray field, that uh, area that nobody's really addressed yet. Yeah, well, it might mean that the blockchain has been poorly designed. I think that uh, we talked in one of the previous action items about the role that blockchain design is going to play. But moving aside from the blockchain, so it seems as though we generally agree that data is owned by somebody typically, and that the ownership of it, as Neil said, means that you can't intercept it at some point in time just because it is easily copied, and then generate rents on it yourself. Uh, David Floyer, what does that mean from a ongoing systems design and development standpoint? How are we going to assure, as Jim said, not only that we know what data is ours, but make sure that we have the right protection strategies in, sense, in, in place to make sure that the data as it moves, we have some influence and control over it? Well, I, I, my starting point is that uh, AI and AI-infused products uh, are fueled by data. You, you need that data, and, and uh, Jim and uh, uh, Neil have already talked about that. Um, the most, if, in my opinion, the most effective way of improving a company's products, whatever the products are, from manufacturing, agriculture, financial services, is to use AI-infused capabilities. That is likely to give you the most best return on your money. And businesses need to focus on their own products. That's the first place you're trying to protect from anything anybody coming in. Businesses own that data. They own the data um, about your products uh, in use by your customers. Uh, use that data to improve your products uh, with AI-infused function and use it before your competition eats your lunch. But let's build on that. So we're not saying that, for example, if you're a storage system supplier, since that's a relatively easy one, you've got very, very fast SSDs, very, very fast NVMe over fabric, great technology, you can collect data about how that system is working, but that doesn't give you rights to then also collect data about how the customer is using the system. The, there, is a, there is a line which you need to make sure that you are covering. Uh, for example, call home on a product, any product. It, whose data is that? You need to make sure that you can use that data. You have some sort of agreement with the customer. And that's a win-win, because you're using that data to improve the product, prove uh, things about it. But th that's very, very clear that you should have a contractual relationship, as uh, uh, Jim and Neil were pointing out. You need the right to use that data. It can't be, can't be underhand. But you must get it, because if you don't get it, you won't be able to improve your products. Now, we're talking here about uh, technology products, which have uh, often very concrete and obvious ownership, and people who are specifically responsible for administering them. But when we start getting into the IoT domain or in, in other places where the device is infused with intelligence uh, but and, for, and might be collecting data that's not directly associated with its purpose, just by virtue mm, of the nature sure. of the sensors that are mm, out there. Mm. And the whole concept of digital twin introduces some tension in all of this. George Gilbert, mm. take us through what's been happening with the overall uh, suppliers of technology that are relating 
related to digital twin building, designing, et cetera. How are they securing or making promises, committing to their customers that they will not cross this data boundary as they improve the quality of their twins? Um, well, as you quoted uh, Jenny Rometty in starting out, she's saying IBM, unlike uh, its competitors, will not uh, take advantage and leverage and monetize your data. But this is, it's a little more subtle than that. And, and um, digital twins are just sort of another manifestation of industry specific sort of solution development that we've done for decades. The difference is, as uh, um, Jim and, and David have pointed out, that with machine learning, it's not so much code that's at the heart of these digital twins. It's the machine learning models, and the data is what's is what informs those models. Now, um, so you don't you don't want all your secret sauce to go from you know Mercedes Benz to BMW, but at the same time, the economics of industry solutions means that you do want some of the repeatability that we've always gotten from uh, industry solutions. You might have parts that are just company specific. And so in IBM's case, if you really parse what they're saying, they, they take what they uh, learn in terms of the models from the data when they're working with uh, BMW, and some of that is going to go into the industry specific models that they're going to use when they're working with Mercedes Benz, if you really, really sort of peel the onion back and ask them, it's the, it's not the models, it's not the features of the models, but it's the coefficients that weight the features or variables in the models that they will keep segregated by customer. So in other words, you get some of the benefits, the economic benefits of reuse across customers in, you know, with, with uh, similar expertise but you don't actually get all of the secret sauce. Now, Ralph, you know, I, I agree with George here. I think that's an interesting topic. And that's the important, one of the important points. Um, it's not kosher to monetize data that you don't own. Um, but conceivably, if you can abstract from that data at some higher level, like what George is describing in terms of weights and coefficients and so forth, in a neural network that's derivative from the model, at some point in the abstraction, where you, you should be able to monetize. I mean, it, you, you, it's like a paraphrase of some copyrighted material. A paraphrase. I, I'm not a lawyer, but you can, you know, you can monitor, you can sell a paraphrase because it's your own original work that's based, obviously, on your reading of Moby Dick or whatever it is you're paraphrasing. Yeah, I yeah, think you might say, I, Jim, I, I, I go ahead. Go ahead. I agree Neil. with I agree with that, but there's it, it, there's a line. Um, there, there was a guy who worked at Capital One. This was about ten years ago. And he was their chief statistician or whatever. This is before we had words like, you know, machine learning and data science. It was called statistics and predictive analytics. Uh, he left the company and formed his own company um, and rewrote and recoded all of the algorithms he had for about 20 different predictive models. Formed a company and then licensed that stuff to Sybase and Teradata and what. Now, the question I have is, did that cross the line or didn't it? These were algorithms that were actually developed in, in, inside Capital One. Did he have the right to use those even if he wrote new computer code to make them run in databases? So it's more than just data, I think. It's a, it's, look, it's a marketplace. And I think that if you own something, someone should not be able to take it and make money on it. But that doesn't mean you can't make an agreement with them to do that. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. Look, IMS and, uh, uh, gets data on prescription drugs and and uh, IRI and Nielsen get scanner data and they pay for it. And then they add value to it and they resell it. So I, I think that's really the issue is the use has to be understood by all the parties and the compensation has to be appropriate to the use. All right, so Ralph Finos, uh, as a guy who looks at market models and, and handles a lot of the fundamentals for how we do our forecasting, uh, look at this from a standpoint of how people are going to make money because clearly what we're talking about sounds like is the idea that any derivative use is embedded in algorithms seeing how those contracts get set up and i got a comment on that in a second uh, but the promise a number of years ago was that people were going to start selling data willy-nilly as a basis for their economic, or their, as a way of capturing value out of their economic activities or their business activities hasn't matured yet generally. Do we see 
like this brand new data economy where everybody's selling data to each other being the way that this all plays out? Yeah, I think I'm having a hard time imagining this as a as a as a marketplace. I think uh, uh, we we pointed at uh, the manufacturing industries, technology industries, where, where where some of this makes some sense. But I think from a, a practitioner perspective, uh, you know, you're looking for variables that are meaningful, that that are in a form you can actually use uh, to make prediction, uh, that you understand, you know, what the the history and the validity of that of that data is and in a lot of cases there's a lot of garbage out there that you can't use and the notion of paying for something that ultimately you look at and say oh crap it's not this isn't really helping me uh it, it's going to be a, 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 a maybe not an insurmountable barrier but it's going to create uh, uh, uh some obstacles in the market for adoption of this kind of thought process you have yeah. to think about the utility yeah. of the data that comes that feeds your models yeah and i think there's going to be a lot of I think there's going to be a lot of legal questions raised, and uh, I recommend that people go look at a recent Silicon Angle article uh, written by Mike Wheatley and edited by our editor-in-chief, Rob Hof, about uh, Microsoft letting technology partners own right to joint innovations. Uh, this is a, quite a difference. This is quite a change for Microsoft, who uh, used to send you, if you sent an email with an idea to them, You'd often get an email back saying, oh, just to let you know, any correspondence we have here is the property of Microsoft. So there clearly is tension in the model about how we're going to utilize data and enable derivative use and how we're going to share, uh, how we're going to appropriate value and share in the returns of that. I think this is going to be an absolutely central feature of business models, certainly in the digital business world, uh, for quite some time. The last thing I'll know, and then I'll get to the action items, the last thing I'll mention here, is that one of the biggest challenges in, in whenever we start talking about how we set up businesses and institutionalize the work that's done, uh, is to look at the nature of the assets and the scope of the assets. And in circumstances where the asset is used by two parties and is generating a high degree of value, as measured by the transactions against those assets, there's always going to be a tendency for one party to try to take ownership of it. Uh, one party that's able to generate uh, greater returns than the other almost always makes move to try to take more control out of that asset. And that's the basis of governance. And so everybody talks about data governance as though it's like something that you worry about with your, your, your you know, backup and restore. And well, that's important, but this notion of data governance increasingly is going to become a feature of strategy and boardroom conversations about what it really means to um, build, you know, create data assets, sustain those data assets, get value out of them, and how we determine whether or not there's a whether or not the right balance is being struck between the value that we're getting out of our data and third parties are getting out of our data, including customers. So with that, let's do a quick action item. David Floyer, I'm looking at you. Why don't we start here? David Floyer, action item. So my action item is for businesses. Uh, you should focus. Focus on data about your products uh, in use by your customers. Uh, to improve, help improve the quality of your products, in, infuse AI into those products uh, as one of the most efficient ways of adding value to it, uh, and do that before your competition has a chance to come in and make, uh, uh, get the ground, the, the data that will stop you from doing that. George Gilbert, action item. I guess mine would be that, um, you, in, in most cases, you, you want to embrace some amount of reuse because of the economics involved from your uh, uh, joint development with a solution provider. But if others are going to get some benefit from uh, sort of reusing some of the uh, intellectual property that informs uh, models that you build, make sure you negotiate with your vendor that any upgrades to those models, whether they're digital twins or in other forms, that there's a canonical version that can come back and be an upgraded path for you as well. Jim Kabilis, action item. Um, my action item is for businesses to regard your data as a product that you monetize yourself, or if you are unable um, to monetize it yourself, if there is a partner like a, uh, a supplier or a customer who can monetize that data and, and then negotiate the terms of that monetization in your 
your, your relationship and be vigilant on that. So you get a piece of that stream, even if the bulk of the work is done by your partner. Uh, Neil Raden, action item. Uh, it's all based on transparency. Your data is your data. No one else can take it without your consent. That doesn't mean that you can't get involved in relationships where there's an agreement to do that. But the problem is most agreements, especially when you look at a business consumer, are so onerous that nobody reads them and nobody understands them. So the person providing the data has to have an unequivocal right to sell it to you, and the person buying it has to really understand what the limits are that they can do with it. Ralph Finos, action item. You're muted, Ralph. But it was brilliant, Sorry whatever it was. What it was, and that, I really can't say much more than that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but I think from a you know a practitioner perspective, uh, and I you know, understand from a manufacturing uh, a perspective how the value could be there. But uh, when you're as a practitioner, if you're fishing for data out there that someone has that might look like something you can use, chances are it's not, and you need to be real careful about uh, spending money uh, to get data that you're not really uh, clear is going to help you. Great. All right. Thanks very much, team. Uh, so here's our action item conclusion for today. The whole concept of digital business is predicated in the idea of using data assets in a differential way to better serve your markets and improve your operations. It's your data. Uh, increasingly, that is going to be the basis for differentiation and any uh, weak uh, undertaking to allow that data to get out has the potential that someone else can, through their data science and their capabilities, re-engineer much of what you regard as your differentiation. We've had conversations with leading data scientists who say that if someone were to sell customer data into an open marketplace, that it would take about four days for a great data scientist to re-engineer almost everything about your customer base. So as a consequence, we have to tread lightly here as we think about what it means to release data into the wild. Ultimately, the challenge there for any business will be, how do I establish the appropriate governance and protections, not just looking at the technology, but rather looking at the overall notion of the data assets. If you don't understand how to monetize your data and nonetheless enter into a partnership with somebody else, by definition, that partner is going to generate greater value out of your data than you are. There are significant information asymmetries here. So it's something that everybody, every company must undertake an understanding of how to generate value out of their data. We don't think that there's going to be a general purpose marketplace for sharing data in a lot of ways. This is going to be a heavily contracted arrangement, but it doesn't mean that we should not take great steps or important steps right now to start doing a better job of instrumenting our products and services so that we can start collecting data about our products and services because the path forward is going to demonstrate that we're going to be able to improve, dramatically improve, the quality of the goods and services we sell by reducing the asset specificities for our customers by making them more intelligent and more programmable. Finally, is this going to be a feature of a differentiated business relationship through trust? We're open to that. Uh, personally, I'll speak for myself, I think it will. I think that there is going to be an important element ultimately of uh, being able to demonstrate to a customer base, to a marketplace, that you take privacy, data ownership, and uh, intellectual property control of data assets seriously, and that you are very, very specific, very transparent in how you're going to use those uh, in, in derivative business transactions. All right, so once again, David Floyer, thank, thank you, you very much here in the studio. On the phone, Neil Raden, Ralph Finos, Jim Kabilis, and George. George Gilbert. This has been another Wikibon action item.